Historia Canadiana is recorded on the unceded lands of the Kanyankaheka First Nation. Hello everyone and welcome to Historia Canadiana, the show where can-lit boys talk about their can-lit toys. I'm never going to let that one go. I think I struck gold with that one last time. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Patrick. And he was a cannon boy. Always... He said, see you later. <laughs> I'm sorry to anyone who's joining us for the first time, except I'm not really, because this is always what we do. It's it's this or nothing. Um, it's wild to me that we, like, we, we're so stupid, but you guys don't get the emails of, like, the kind of interviews Patrick is setting up for the future right now. <laughs> and it's, like, members of the Order of Canada. It's like... It's two different personalities, basically. Yeah, like, isn't one of the ones you're doing soon, like, member of the order and co-chair of Rogers or something? Yeah, he's like the, I'm trying to set up um, an interview with, if I remember, Phil Lind. So he's the VP of communications, I believe, at Rogers. Yeah, and it's it would be an episode on, you might actually be interested in being on that episode because it's, if we can make it happen, because it's on uh, the gold rush, the Yukon gold mm. rush. Um, okay. Yeah. We'll talk about it off air, but um, but yeah, it's just wild. Yeah, by the way, this is Mackenzie with me. <laughs> yes, of course, as always, as always to bring disrupt the airwaves and sound discord. But yeah, that's what makes the show fun. Um, Here is the English literature expert that barely reads the literature. Hell yeah, but you read this one, so I that's did. cool. Yo, I um, fuck with this book so hard. <laughs> Um, which is rare on the show. Like we're actually getting into an era where the books are much more interesting to read. So congratulations, listening public. You made it to almost 80 episodes of okay books. And now we're getting to the good stuff. It's not even, no, it's not even that they were bad books before. It's the fact that we've been in a fucking drudge of reading goddamn like yeah. memos and political manifestos. Yeah, yeah, I know. Like I get it. Confederation is important, but God, do I hate Confederation. <laughs> Guess what we're doing next episode, though? Shoot me. <laughs> we're doing Laurier, so that one's going to be fun. Okay, that one I, mean, I am interested. I need to talk. We need to talk about the Sunshine Kid. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the Sunshine okay. Kid. Is this going to be another two-parter for this Prime Minister? Probably. He was there for long enough. I can imagine that being a well, thing. He's, yeah, well, he's also, like, he is, like, when you think of the Canadian Prime Minister, you think of McDonald him and then probably yeah. trudeau like pierre yeah. elliott trudeau yeah of course yeah but at this point yeah. justin's been there for a while too yeah but not nearly no that's true i don't know. Um, anyway yeah so before we get into the episode thanks to our patrons uh keen alex jessica Ibiz, tommy james belinda noah paula yeah if you want to help support the show you can do so by signing up for patreon for a dollar a month you get access to early episodes of the show uh, usually oh, we yeah. record about 24 hours to 48 hours in advance. And for $3 a month, you get access to an extra show a month. So that's pretty cool. Um, it's all about pop culture in Canada. And I don't know what our next episode is going to be about, but we'll record it next week. Pop Canada? Um, pop yeah. Canada? I don't know. Same thing. So today we're going to be talking um, about two things, naturally, history and literature. But we're going to be talking specifically about the Boer War. And unfortunately, there is no Pumba. It's not a war between various Pumbas. I'm very sad about that. But hey, God. missed opportunity. <laughs> yeah, which is, as we were saying before the show, very sad because there are actual Boers in South Africa, like the animal. But unfortunately, it's not that metal. Um, and we're going to be doing, uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about the war, but to be honest, we're not a military history podcast, and I know that there are some out there that talk mm -hmm. specifically about Canada, and probably as far as like del delving deeply into the war itself, they'll do a much better job, and that's fine, right? That's yeah, not we cool. don't know, and the general sentiment we have on this show is that we understand the necessity of war, but we are not to those that understand. We're not like super like into it, the study of combat. We're both fairly squeamish when it comes to real life, I'd say. <laughs> yeah. No, I Patrick likes his pulpy, it. schlocky horror for sure, but in real life, we're both pretty like, oh no, a drop of blood. Faints like a 1950s housewife. 
Yep. I'm completely comfortable with being associated with, with that image. <laughs> but I think the idea here, um, obviously, we're going to be talking about the political response to the Boer War when we talk about Laurier next episode, because that mm -hmm. was a whole thing in and of itself. Whereas what I was hoping to do with this episode is talk about the more general Canadian population response and how obviously culturally that was that played out and how that reflects just how you know the average Canadian person would have felt about sending um sending troops to a conflict that really <clears throat> had little bearing on right <clears throat> to almost no bearing right um so yeah do you know anything about the Boer War it happened in South Africa <laughs> <laughs> okay like you got like, a great start uh, I'm not a again like I'm not a huge war guy and whenever we talked about war in class we always talked about other parts so for example when I learned about World War II in primary secondary school it was mostly in the view of like the children that got sent away definitely what's kind of interesting about the Boer War or it was it's also known as the South Africa second South African war um mm -hmm. is that the way people kind of talk about it especially on the political levels at the time it was like a big deal and like it caused mm -hmm. a lot of controversies especially if we talk about from the Canadian perspective in this case and it's it's interesting to talk about because people really took it seriously for a long time but then like about 10 years later the first world war happened and just kind of overshadowed everything and made people realize how much they were making a fuss out of very little at the time mm -hmm. um <laughs> but nonetheless I still think it's I don't want to diminish the fact that obviously people died and there were some really horrible things that happened because it was war um <laughs> but it, it is kind of interesting war to know <sighs> what is it good for absolutely nothing yeah. sing again boys so it is actually kind of interesting to consider that things the, the way we imagine the boer war and thing the actual events of the boer war do kind mm -hmm. of reflect a lot of what would happen in the 20th century wars that people know and remember right the first and second ones um, in terms of like actual the way that we imagine it as a country, our relation to, in this case, the British Empire, and even as we'll see, the way that the British acted during the Boer War, which not fun. Um, yeah, it was boring for everybody involved. It wasn't actually; it was a horrible time with atrocities on both sides. I think I'll try to insert like a cricket noise <laughs> into that one. God, if I remember to do it. <laughs> so the uh, I just wanted to give a little bit of setup as to the actual Boer War in this case, or South African War. So it happened at the tail end of the 19th century and into the 20th century. So 1899 to 1902. The historians are kind of unsure as to, or at least not unsure, there are multiple conflicting ideas of this as to why it actually began, right? But the most straightforward explanation that I could find is that the Boers, who were basically farmers in this case, um, it's an Afrikaner term for farmer, and they're mostly composed of Dutch um, immigrants uh, to that region in this case, because that was the colonial uh, and imperial understanding at the time. So these people led by Paul Kruger, who was uh, the Boer leader, refused to grant political rights to what were known as Utland. Right? I hope I'm mm -hmm. pronouncing this right. I don't know Afrikaners or Dutch. I'm sorry. But it basically translates to foreigner in this case, which is ironic mm -hmm. considering that they are descendants of Dutch people in Africa. <laughs> we're also foreigners, I guess. <laughs> Getting some weird. There are two vibes. things that I hate. There are two things that I hate, Patrick. Making fun of other people's cultures and the Dutch. You know, that's a reference to something and I can't remember what it is. I just had to make the joke. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's fine. Um, so from the Boer perspective, these foreigners, these Utlanders, um, were mostly English uh, people who wanted to come in for mining purposes. In this. Um, and they were also kind of put off by the aggressiveness of the British High Commissioner, whose name was Alfred Milner. And basically, it started a war. And then there was war. <laughs> because, of course, 
like what what else starts wars in the 19th century except wanting to have access to natural resources like mining and yo people, what else right? starts wars today like this hasn't changed right the more things change the more they stay the same you know at least you can say with like the second world war it was for vaguely it was for moral reasons at least that's kind of mm. like afterwards what was uh, what we told ourselves but yeah, I, at least at the time, it wasn't even, we didn't even have another pretense. It was just like, yeah, no, I want I want that moolah that you get from mining South Africa. What the fuck is yeah. wrong with you? Of course, that's going to start a war. I just admire the simplicity and the straightforwardness of the imperial machine at that point. Um, <laughs> but because the British were involved, and despite the fact that Canada was nominally its own country at this point by 1899 right confederation had happened 32 years prior um canada still sent troops in this case because you know uh, this would only come with the second world war we kind of automatically felt the need to send troops wherever the british sent troops it was part of our imperial duty right um it hadn't officially become the commonwealth so mm -hmm. But Matt, tell me, what do Canadians care about mining opportunities in South Africa? Fuck if I know, man. Canadians have mining opportunities here that they usually take advantage of anyway. So your answer of fuck if I know is pretty much the same answer that a lot of Canadians had at that moment of like, why are we? Who are the boar? What are we doing? What's South Africa? <laughs> Oh, He's like a bunch of question marks. It's that meme of that woman with the math coming out at you, just staring <laughs> blankly into space. <laughs> but nonetheless, despite this confusion, by the time the war ended in May of 1902, there had been over 7,000 young Canadians, officially aged 22 to 40, but some of them were as young as 15 because age is just a number, um, had true. served with British troops by then. So you know, in three years, 7,000 people, that's still quite a massive chunk in this case. Obviously, it's nothing compared to what we would send overseas during the world wars. But nonetheless, it's a very noticeable number. Um, and as, again, foreshadowing the 20th century, Canada and Canadian um, regiments, from what I've read, again, I'm not a military expert in this case, from what I've read, actually did demarcate themselves as being quite um willing to fight I mean, you know at least once they got over there obviously it was mixed reception here and we'll talk about it again next week with uh, next episode with laurier but especially in quebec we were we had mixed feelings about sending help to the british for obvious reasons um the toy but yeah exactly but nonetheless like once we were over there apparently it was quite um quite impressive <laughs> work that we did and you know we sent uh, by by then by the way we would have our own regiments like right, that mm -hmm. were uh, trained on canadian soil in canadian military bases they weren't as developed as they were today but we still had like installations here that allowed us to train what were known as the royal canadian dragoons for example which were a i'm blanking on the term right now the ones on horses cavalry that's the word um we had, you know, the Royal Canadian Field Artillery. Um, we had the Canadian Mounted Rifles. Like, all of these were established regiments prior to the Boer War in this mm -hmm. case. So we were able to send all of these troops. Apparently, there was a specific group. I didn't look much into it just because it's not the point of the show in this case. But there were about 300 Canadians who joined irregular British forces such as one that's called Howard's Canadian Scouts, which on the surface, just with the name, doesn't sound like much because it's scouts. <laughs> In this case, it sounds like Boy Scout. But apparently, they, were, they became known and kind of legendary in the Boer War for disdaining military discipline or standard military discipline and mm -hmm. be, having this reputation of being like these hard-riding, implacable, and death-defying soldiers. <laughs> They were the jackass of 1899. <laughs> South you know, Africa. They were you know what they also probably did? They were what? probably really into hockey. <laughs> now I'm just imagining a bunch of boars or Afrikaners going up against 
hockey stick wielding Canadians. Damn straight. In South Africa. <laughs> God damn it. Um, but yeah, despite you know these mixed feelings and um, these kinds of uh, you know disdains apparently for military discipline and proper action, um, mm-hmm. there were three celebrated battles that Canada participated in, or at least sent troops to in this case. And again, I'll probably butcher the names here, but they were at Hardenburg, uh, Lillyfontaine, and Hearts River. I'm just going to go over these three uh, a little bit before we get into the literature proper, which, as we talked about before, is sunshine, sunshine sketches of a little town. Um, so at Harderberg, the uh, the RCR, the Royal Canadian Regiment, um, this was their first battle, but it also became the costliest um, mm-hmm. uh, out of all the skirmishes that they would face during this war. And it took part in two sections, basically, in two engagements that were separated by about a week. And both engagements were designed to surround and capture the uh, Boer forces, which numbered about 4,000. And on what would became known as one of the many, quote unquote, bloody Sundays, which in this case was February 18th, 1900, at a place called Paderberg Drift, um, a poorly planned British assault left 18 Canadian dead and 63 wounded in this case, um, which doesn't seem like that many in the grand scheme of things, right, out of 7,000 <laughs> people. But apparently, when I was looking it up, it's actually Canada's bloodiest battle since the War of 1812. Jesus. <laughs> like, having 18 dead and 63 wounded, bloodiest thing we had to deal with in almost 100 years. So, you know, <laughs> positives. I guess, mm-hmm. that, we're, that we didn't have to deal with that much. Um, obviously, that was going to change about 15 years later. Um, and the second uh, engagement um, would be more on the front lines. And in this case, the Canadians themselves led an early morning assault on what by then was like a demoralized Boer fortification. And this the fact that they kind of kicked the Boers, while they were down in this case, nevertheless kind of faced or at least gained a lot of like propaganda uplift. And it gave the Canadian troops like this exaggerated sense of Mm -hmm. like appeal in this case. And they're like, woo, we actually did something really cool and important (laughs) in this war, even though they took a fortification that was probably easy to take in this. Mm -hmm. Um, Nonetheless, it was kind of like the first major victory for both Canadians within that small circle, but also for the British in the war, right? Because up until then, they had actually faced a significant amount of loss. So I don't know if you can, you know, exaggeratedly claim that it was the it was purely thanks to Canada in this case, but you know that's kind of what the mythology of the time said, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, we were essential to the contribution of Britain's first victory in the South African War. And nobody remembers. <laughs> like, um, the second battle, the one at Lily Fontaine, would happen in November of 1900. And this one was, um, this one featured the Royal Canadian Dragoons and the Canadian Mounted Rifles, um, as well as a few people from the Royal Canadian Field Artillery. And this one really earned like a huge amount of admiration back home and abroad for their courage and stamina, right? As they were basically covering a British retreat. Um, and for this whole affair, right, in which um, which lasted quite a bit of time, apparently, um, there were two Canadians that were killed, 11 were wounded, but because of their strategy and ingenuity and courage, there's actually three Canadians who won the Victoria Cross during this uh, during this particular or for this particular skirmish, um, which is an unprecedented number of Canadians to have won this award in one single battle. Um, I don't know if it was beaten afterwards because, again, not a military expert in this case. Mm-hmm. But up until that point, like that was unheard of that this many Canadians won this many medals or Victoria Crosses in a single battle. So cool. Good for them. Um, 
And the last one at Hearts River um, happened about two years later, a year and a half later, on March in March of 1902, where the Second Canadian Mounted Rifles um, provided what was later conceived as like a really uh, you know, good example of Canadian heroism. Uh, 13 dead and 40 wounded, and the for uh, in sorry, let me start that again. And in particular, there were two people in this case. Uh, sorry, three people: Bruce Caruthers, William N- Nisley, Nisley, and Charles Napier Evans. Um, for their uh, for this particular battle, became symbols of Canadian martial courage. This case. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's kind of an overview or at least very brief overview of three of the main battles in this case. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add in this case, but yeah, um, it's just, I, I, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's still just fascinating to me how much we can hit upon like the ways Canada really tries to make itself feel important in these battles, in these wars yep. <laughs> and just, how often Canada will be there trying to extol its virtues. It's like, dude, you guys just fought in a war. Like, everybody does this. No, but we did it cool. Like, we were cool while doing it. And we helped the British. So We were at the Battle of Vimy Ridge, you guys. Gosh. Did you hear, by the way, okay, completely derailing this. Did you hear about the, like, passport thing here in Canada? Right, I know. You probably don't get this news out in Australia at this point, but they decided to change the past mm-hmm. here in Canada. Um, and you, I imagine you still have your, your Canadian passport in this case, but yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, it's like a bunch of historical moments in this case um, at the back uh, yeah. that are drawn on. And they decided to change it to like non-historical moments. So like there's a squirrel and there's people playing hockey and stuff like that. Like just like playing iconography of Canada. Right, exactly. But like people are losing their shit over it God. because it's like whitewashing or like it's erasing history or something like that. Um, which obviously everyone learns their history from the back of a passport. I don't I think what history is it erasing? But the fact that they're just not talking about it. they're just removing the any mentions of Canadian history by putting things like squirrel on the back of it instead of instead of Vinnie Ridge or something like that. I'm sorry. If we want to talk about Canadian history, let's put in all those instances of First Nations genocide then. That's the thing. Like, it's like, if this is your problem. That's the thing is like, you know, I, I liked the old passport. Like it's it's fine. And I, I'm happy with the 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 symbols that they chose in it. But it's like I don't care that they changed it to, <laughs> to fucking squirrels. It's just like it's such a non issue to me. Like it was I, fine honestly, before. I bet it's a non issue to most people. But there's like a couple of trolls yeah. who are pretending that it's a big deal and which made it blow up even more. Or there's like some diehards out there, you know, like because that's the case with most of these issues. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, we're obviously now an international joke because our passport sucks. We've always been an international joke. Except during the Boer War. Flawless which, segue. Which country? All countries are international jokes to each other. Like, no country is going to be like, ah, yes, that country. Like, they know. They're all like, oh, these fuckers. No, Canada's known for being cool sometimes. It is. Except no, it is. Prime Minister Can- does blackface. No, it is known for being cool internationally and all that shit or whatever, but like, even then, like, it's not like people are like, oh, Canada, like, we're going to listen and respect and be in awe of Canada. It's like, no, they're just cool dudes. Absolutely. So coming back to the topic at hand in this case. So it's estimated that about 270 Canadians in total were buried in South Africa during this conflict, which over three years nice. is quite a substantial number. Um, and but we, we know now that about half of them were would die because of disease actually again Mm -hmm. kind of foreshadowing the first world war in this case and a lot of wars like i don't think people kind of realize just how frequent it is people obviously talk about it a lot in the context of the first world war of like what happened in the trenches because it was Mm. significant awful yeah but disease like was a major major you know um reason why people died at war much uh, much more than people might anticipate uh, in this case. Disease, um, famine, all sorts of fun things. Yeah, exactly. Like bad food, 
<laughs> gives you an infection or something like that. Um, yeah, pneumonia, really whatever mm -hmm. comes to mind because vaccines weren't much of a thing <clears throat> back then. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah, disease killed a surprising amount of people. And apparently during the South African conflict, it was about half, which quite noticeable. Um, and on top of those 270 who are buried in South Africa, about 250 more can be added as wounded. Um, what's interesting is that you do have you know, some people like Ottawa trooper LWR Malloy, uh, who's just one example, but he, for example, lost both eyes in the conflict and would kind of stay at the time within Canadians' minds as kind of the human cost like or a living monument, I should say, to the human cost of the Canadian participation. Once again, in this very distant conflict that most Canadians couldn't tell you what we sent people there for, right? Most people Still can't tell day. you what we send Canadians for in most conflicts. Like That's the thing, right? And it's, again, we're talking about this, like this event that happened 150 years ago, 120 years ago, but, um, you know, the same questions kind of arise over and over again whenever we talk about war and like these same events of seeing people come back with ruined lives and, you know, trauma, both physically and mentally. And you're like, no, this is a good idea to keep sending them back. Yay, trauma. <laughs> but that's the thing. It's like we're, we're making light of it. And obviously it's not something to necessarily make light of, except no. when we talk about Stephen Leacock. But... Um, <laughs> I mean, my it's, making light of trauma is more in the reflection of how the government really makes light of these yeah. traumas without actually having proper veteran support. Absolutely. Or minimal. Minimal, yeah. Minimal. Yeah. Really, like, this whole, this whole thing started uh, where it was really, like, noticed in mm -hmm. Canadian uh, discourse at the time of being, like, starting to, like, lay the seeds or lay the foundations for questioning you know, not just French Canada's allegiance to Britain, because that was always tenuous at best. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you started to see resistance uh, within English Canada as well, right? Which, again, would obviously become more pronounced with the First World War, because those mm -hmm. debates would just explode. And again, with the Second World War. Um, yeah, I don't know. Do you have anything to add on this point before we get to the literature? Like, uh, I've already said some things, but uh, I don't know. Is there anything you wanted to add to this? About uh, the wars, the wars with yeah. the Boers. I'm, people are always going to be surprised about the fact that countries are in wars or in battles or whatever, and it's, mm -hmm. they shouldn't be. Like, we're not in, technically speaking, we're not in some kind of peacetime right now. People are still fighting overseas. We just pulled out of Afghanistan. Like, the World War Three is already happening. It's just happening with satellite states and with internet doxing and everything else. Oh, yes. The third world war that everyone anticipated. You're canceled on Twitter. <laughs> no, but I mean more in like all these articles we see about China yeah, putting yeah. microchips in our computers or whatever and blah, blah, blah. Russia. Yeah. Like this is the new war of the world. It's yeah. the cybercrime war. That's the thing. And like it becomes a war because but it's, the, it's world. I don't know if you'd say World War Three or Cold War Part Two. Because Cold War Part Two, the literal electric boogaloo. No, but honestly, though, when you think about it, like obviously, the, this is not like anything new that I'm saying, right? People have compared our current state of affairs to the Cold War before, right? But yeah, like mm -hmm. it is a different type of war when you think about it. Like that proxy element, I think, is integral to the kind of Cold yeah. War that you're seeing now, right? And the misinformation is bigger than ever in this case, especially now in an era of fake news and whatever which was always there but now it's like front and center in people's minds even though they're not actually doing anything concrete to change mm -hmm. so yeah i don't know i would, I would say cold war ii not world war three <laughs> but only time will tell in this case who's to say um okay literature so literature again we've been making this point but i think it's 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 an important one to reiterate especially as we enter into the cultural segment of the show in this case is that you know there's been a lot there was a lot of literature about the boer war that came out around that time poetry was major you know uh, yeah out of every like, war will come poetry and art depicting its horror for sure but like or even mentioning it in the background like i, I noted in the notes um Sarah Jeanette Duncan's The Imperialist, 
which is actually a really good novel. It's problematic mm. by today's standards, but it's actually an interesting novel. Um, like does have the Boer War in its background because it was just there and prevalent in people's minds. And people kind of forget this because very shortly after there was just the most devastating war ever at that time that affected literally every nation on the planet at that point. Um, so but it still show, go, goes to show just how much it was in people's psyche at, at this point. Yeah, and there are plenty of things that we could have talked about, but yeah, we decided to take um, Sunshine Sketches of a Little Town by Stephen mm-hmm. Peacock, which is a comedy in this case. It's, it's satire. a humor satire. Yeah, um, and there's a reason for this, I think. Like, I think that adds to the interest of talking about the war through that lens in this case, and we'll, we'll mm-hmm. get to that. Um, but yeah, I also just pulled up and it'll be in the show notes. I don't think there's much to say about it, but I did pull up a poem by Robert Service, who was a well-known writer at the time, um, called March of the Dead, which I just wanted Mm -hmm. to read a brief excerpt of just to kind of bring us into like the perception that people had of the war at the time and what kind of the sentiment was. Um, yeah, I'll just read the first, uh, stanza. The cruel war was over. Oh, the triumph was so sweet. We watched the troops returning through our tears. There was triumph, triumph, triumph down the scarlet glittering street. And you could scarce hear the music for the cheers, and you scarce could see the housetops for the flags that flew between. The bells were pealing madly to the sky, and everyone was shouting for the soldiers of the queen. And the glory of an age was passing by. Like, I know you're not the biggest fan of poetry, but... Mm-hmm. And this is not like the most brilliant poem we've ever read either. <laughs> um, but I do find it interesting to at least mention that it starts off, it starts off with an acknowledgement that, you know, the war was particularly cruel and we'll get to Leacock's own perspective on it mm-hmm. in this case. Um, and then midway through the, or at least right in the war is cruel. Stanza, Wild. Yeah. Who knew? Right. But he starts off with an acknowledgement of that, then talks about how everyone's celebrating. And then he segues back into, and the glory of an age was passing by. Like there's, he's, he's kind of sandwiching the celebratory elements into an acknowledgement that, well, this is kind of bracketed off by a very dark period in the world at this moment. Right. And I guess service is kind of forced seeing, in a sense, the 20th century and the kind of wars that the Boer War definitely kind of proto represented in this case. And I just wanted to mention it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have anything to add about this particular poem, but yeah, it was just, I thought it was a good introductory. Yeah, no, it is. And it's a good way to understand the fact that even in its time, people were still kind of seeing this as kind of a weird thing for Canada to be involved in, I think. Yeah. 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 And like, yes, there's, um, like for a long time, the veneer, like um, there's a really good book by Carl Berger called The Sense of Power. And mm-hmm. I didn't mention it at the top of the show, but he does have a good, he does have a good statement in his book where he mentions like for a long time, military might was just the ultimate way. And it still is, right? For In, in many ways, it's like the ultimate way that Canada demonstrated its cultural value which we've seen on the show before, right, is through military mind, mm-hmm. right? The War of 1812 was like a major thing for some reason. Um, and it kind of made this, you know, cohesive national heritage. But you start to see that chipping away with the Boer War. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, it's at least good to note, even though war is still used for propagandistic purposes, of course, and it always will. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It exists to make rich people richer and to, you know, destroy your enemies. So nothing's going to change on that. Okay, let's get into some of the satire. Yay. So you read Sunshine Sketches, right? Yes, a while back in my undergrad. Yeah, well, um, what can you tell us about Leacock as an author, Stephen Leacock? Do you know much about him? Um, mostly just what I, the things I remember, you know, big Canadian author, big humorist, 
writing around the turn of the century. So obviously in that time when Canada was trying to really establish its Canadian canon of literature, which is still kind of a stupid fucking discussion to me. <laughs> yeah, that's that's always the issue with any kind of canon making, but yeah, you know, whether it's yeah. in Canada or not. Well, I mean, you, you can't do those things at the time. You can't at the time be like, we are we are the Canadian kids. It's like, no, that's not your decision. That's history's decision. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's like saying if you're cool, if you have to say you're cool and you're not cool. Anyway, <clears throat> so Leacock, humorist, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Do you know much about his politics? No, but I can imagine he was a bit more liberal. Wrong. Really? By the standards of the time, he was conservative. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, Interesting. So he was... A, yeah, he was very much an ardent um, Tory in this case, um, and someone who I've argued in my master's thesis was mm-hmm. straight through a lineage of conservatism from our early episode on Halliburton in this case. So, um, but what's interesting is that again we can't think of like conservatism in Lee Cox's time as being the same as it is now, right? Um, as you mentioned before on the show, right? Conservatism at the time mm-hmm. was like still, it's, it, it could still have some like socially progressive elements to it. Um, and it was still very much defined by it's like pull yourself up by the bootstraps type of thing, which to an extent still exists today, obviously. But um, you know, now it's slightly different. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> but Politically speaking, and what I think is interesting to consider in the context of this particular discussion, Leacock was known uh, as what was called a Canadian imperial. Do you know what that is? We've talked about it, I think, briefly. Do you know no, like what that refers to in this case? I, I think we briefly did, but you're going to have to remind yeah. me. Yeah, like just off the top of your head, if you hear that term, what do you think it is in this case? Um, God, I don't even know. Like, what the fuck, Canada? <laughs> Canadian imperialism, because what can, Canada's a, Canada's a colony. Right. So basically, the whole idea of quote-unquote Canadian imperialism, and again, that's kind of the point of Harl Berger's book, um, The Sense of Power in this case, is to like construct what that was. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was basically a group of men who wanted Canada to be the center of empire of the British empire in this case, rather than Britain, because Mm -hmm. they saw Canada as being morally and ethically, politically, and culturally superior to Britain, which they saw as being in a state of decay at this point um, in history. So in the late 19th century, in this case. Mm -hmm. So you're not actually far off, like, what the fuck? Canada's a colony. How can it be the center of empire? Well, that's kind of the point in this case was... Yeah, we're, we want to change that. Um, so yeah, that's that's a bit on his politics in this case. So yes, uh, Leacock would have been conservative, but he was still very critical by his politics of Britain mm-hmm. in this case and their practice. And to um, bring it in this case to, um, to uh, relation with the Boer War in this case, do you have in front of you the quote by Leacock that I put in the notes. Uh, this is on page four of the notes. It's in the uh, oh. negative interpretation. It's like a big paragraph. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the, in the talking about the concentration camps. Yeah. So do you want to read that one out loud? And we'll, sure. uh, that'll kind of give you a sense of what Leacock's thoughts of the war were. <clears throat> Goddamn war. Leacock in real life in the concentration camp, 20,000 women and children died. What do you think of women huddled into tents with their corpses of their children, sometimes two days old in the tent with them? I know of a mother who made a coffin for her little children out of the sides of biscuit boxes and tried to bury it herself in the sand. Yet these same people sent word out to their husbands never to surrender. While this was happening here, drunken fools shouted in London and Toronto the celebration of Moth King and Pretoria. It was one huge crime from start to finish, organized and engineered by a group of lutocrats and tyrants and carried out on a ruthlessly as the wars of an Asiatic conqueror. And that is the British Empire, that imperialism. However, no use worrying you about it. So obviously someone who's very satisfied with the British Empire. Oh, just loves the empire. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. He would have, he would have made a big deal about the queen dying. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Um, 
but yeah, this is not something we mentioned because I knew this quote was coming up in this case, but yeah, like mm -hmm. the, the British, again, another relation to the 20th century in this case, you know, concentration camp, not great, obviously not going to get, uh, not, to, not going to get anything else um, from us, but yeah, obviously horrible, horrible stuff. And mm -hmm. that's, but it's still, still um, Leacock's criticism goes deeper than the fact of the concentration camps, which are obviously terrible, but he's using it as an example of saying like, this whole thing is just a sham, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're, we're sending people to die in just horrendous condition, just so people can get rich and powerful. Fuck that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, it's crazy. Imagine if people did that in modern times. Yeah. Obviously, people would revolt. <laughs> oh, did you see noises. E Elon Musk was there trying to like prove that he didn't get his start with money from an emerald mine that his dad operated? And he was like, I want, if one person can show me proof, I'll give them this amount of money. His dad literally tweeted at him and said, I'm your dad. I have the proof. Give me the money. What? That's so funny. <laughs> what a fucking psycho. I, I know I've said it on the show actually before. Actually unhinged. I know I've said it on the show before. I He's one of the worst human beings alive. And, you know, say what you will about him buying Twitter. I'm happy that people are just seeing how unhinged of a man through that. Mm -hmm. Just like, and obviously the people who admire him are not going to change their opinion because people get their opinions in a silo and that's just the state of media now. But like, what a shit human being, you know? Well, it was so like for a while we were almost we were all almost drinking the Kool Aid that Elon Musk was going to be the savior or whatever. But now, like the more he does, the more he reveals just who he is. You know, it's just a psycho. But whatever. Every day, it's just he crazy. Does something like, like yeah, he's just a case of too much genius and too much crazy. And he's not a genius. That's the thing. Like he has other people do things for him. Mm the most infuriating thing ever <laughs> he hasn't done a single fucking thing in his life but whatever but hey he's gonna be the one that's gonna send us to mars and create hyper trains in california or something that are obviously God. never gonna happen so, so back to the sunshine whatever. sketches anyway so the sunshine sketches themselves are short stories but they're all connected. it's a collection of short stories all taking place in a little town and there's like a little of like there's some connections between them all basically where there's like this nice little couple of events. But the idea is basically to talk about like the relation to the war, but also just rural Canada in general and what does pastoral Canada look like. Like the town Mary Post is basically a stand in for any small Canadian town. Absolutely. And it's funny as fuck. Like I, know, I cannot I state how much this book still slaps from a modern Give perspective. Give an example. Do you have any, like, we're, we have specific ones related to the war, but do you have an example of, like, a moment oh, that really it's... made you laugh? So, like, the when we were reading, because I was rereading the short story about the judge, the curious case yep. of Mr. Pumpkin or Pumpkin or something, whatever it was. Pumpkin. Yeah. Pumpkin. And Jesus Christ, the whole time when it's, like, talking about the moving moment with his son and the judge in the courtroom, and then it just ends with, but his son was drunk when he made that punch. <laughs> It was, but nobody would tell the judge that. We'll come back to that point. It's very funny, but it's also like deeply like, insightful. I I'm not doing it justice. Like you have to read this book because the satire goes hard. Oh yeah, and it's like there's a reason why there's a medal named after Leacock for comedy in this case. Like in terms of structure and just comedy writing. He nails it. Just like set up yeah. punchline, let's go. And it's simultaneously subtle, but there's also just these moments where it just reminds you of an episode of The Simpsons where it's just in your face. And it's it's great, honestly. Like, and of course, Leacock as a man is a problematic figure. He was like an ardent racist. Um, okay, yeah. Like again, who wasn't in the early 20th century? Um so it's it, it it has kind of like spoiled his legacy in a sense for for some people and i can understand that but just as a text in itself fucking it is just really good um i'm trying to find i think it's at the beginning of the text uh just i i, I like yeah just the first paragraph i think is really good the very opening lines of the book i don't know whether you know mariposa if not it's of no consequence 
for if you know Canada at all, you are probably well acquainted with a dozen towns just like it. There it lies in the sun, sloping up from the little lake that spreads out at the foot of the hillside at which the town is. And he goes on to basically describe this thing. And you're like, yeah, I've met exactly a million towns like this. A hundred, mm-hmm. like just go 20 minutes outside of Montreal and you'll find five. Right. And, oh, and the point, the point is more like, this is a very Canadian book in that way. Like, this book is so specifically Canadian. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, it's just like, it is funny, though, saying like, it's of no consequence. No one cares. Right? Yeah. Like, and yet everyone thinks it matters, right? In yeah. the town. It's, yeah. It's such a it funny. blinding celebration and indictment at the same time of like that small town mentality. I know. Um like the the one of the funniest fucking jokes I saw there was the again like the judge the judge of Mr. Pumpkin or whatever and it's talking about the betrayal and it's oh, like, there yes. was a sim no one had known such a betrayal maybe there was a similar one in Rome but in a much smaller scale and I sat there for a moment and I was like are they talking about the fucking Ides of March yes <laughs> either that or Julius Caesar getting stabbed. Right. Yeah. Isn't it? That is the eyes of March, isn't it? <laughs> isn't it? Uh, for what? No. Yes. Sorry. Yes. I, for a yeah. minute, I thought the eyes of March was any way was when he marched on Rome. But uh, yeah. Anyway. But probably. And I'm like, I, I'm reading this book, and you know what it reminded me of? Like these little vignettes of a small town that everybody knows in Canada. You know what it reminded me of? You're nodding. Do. You. Yeah. 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 Uh, like, go ahead. Sorry. It reminded me of Letter Kenny. I fucking knew it. <laughs> yeah absolutely it's exactly again, that. like um, these like because for them these problems really are the end of the world they are bigger than the ides of march to them you know yeah absolutely and it's fine like it's i don't fine. think it's, he's it's going hilarious in. yeah and like i don't think he's not mean-spirited i think in his comedy which was what makes it good in this case right he's not going out to like tear these people a new one right who think mm-hmm. this way there's something no, not at all. point about it. Yeah. There's something point and like kind of interesting nonetheless, right? Despite the fact that, yeah, obviously it's not like the death of Julius Caesar. <laughs> it's not at all the, the, that same thing and it never will be, but it doesn't matter in this case. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's I, just, um, yeah. There's, it's, but, and it's also just such a wonderfully well-written book, how he takes you yeah. through the town. Yeah. Like, because the book opens with like you taking a train into town, getting off at the station. Mm-hmm. And it's the same way getting back on the train. It's like an episode of Mr. Rogers. Yeah, it's like it's almost like its own little episode of like Leonard Kennedy, Mr. Rogers, and the Twilight Zone rolled into one. Um, there's a really good um there's a critic actually named Carl Spadoni who described ne- nevertheless, like, and this I think is what we'll focus on in particular, because you could, like we said before, we could do a whole episode on Sunshine sketches, right? There's a lot mm-hmm. to talk about in this case. Um, but there, there is a critic who also described it as a powerful commentary on the importance of shared values in a community and of Canada's place within the British Empire, right? And mm-hmm. I think it's from that perspective that we can kind of approach uh, the Boer War more generally and how it was seen by uh, the community in Canada, right, on a more localized level, not on a political level, right? Um, and on page 44, 45, um, and by the way, I'll link for the book, obviously, for people following at home, but uh, um, on page 44, 45, there's like an interesting description that I think points to this in this particular case, and like the relations that this town of Mariposa has in relation to Britain, right? Mariposa. And, right. Um, I can read it if you want. You read the, uh, you read a small part. Um at the bottom Rock of and roll. In this. So he says, perhaps I ought to explain that when I speak of the, of the excursion as being of the Knights of Pythia, the thing must not be understood in an, any narrow sense. In Mariposa, practically everyone belongs uh, to the Knights of Pythias, just as mm-hmm. they do to everything else. That's the great thing about the town, and that's what makes it so different from the city. Everybody is in everything. You should see him on the 17th of March, for example when everybody wears a green ribbon and they're all laughing uh, and glad. You know what the Celtic nature is. 
and talking about home rule, so Irish <laughs> relation. On St. Andrew's Day, every man in town wears a thistle and shakes hands and everybody else uh, with everybody else. And you see the fine old Scot honesty beaming out their eyes. And on St. George's Day, well, there's no hardiness like the good old English spirit after all. Why shouldn't a man feel glad that he's an Englishman? Then on the 4th of July, there are stars and stripes flying over half the stores in town, and suddenly all the men are seen to smoke cigars and to know all about Roosevelt and Byron um, and the Philippine Island. Then you mm -hmm. learn for the first time that Jeff Thorpe's people came from Massachusetts and that his uncle fought at Bunker Hill. It must have been on Bunker Hill. Anyway, Jefferson will swear it was in Dakota all right. In it. Um, so this kind of passage is important I think for our discussion in this case, because it's cult the cultural cues of Mariposa come from elsewhere uh, in this case, right? It's, it's not itself, uh, but it is itself insofar as, you know, again, it's uh, yeah, it's cultural cue Britain mostly mm -hmm. and a bit of this. And, you know, I'm sure you can say something about this in this case, but like, obviously this, I don't know if he intended it directly as such, but very much, you know, within his own politics of saying like, hey, how about we don't take everything from Britain <laughs> in this case, right? Or how about we don't just blindly send people over to South Africa just because the British wanted it to. Mm -hmm. But of course, most people wouldn't think that way. Um, yeah, I don't know if you had anything to say about uh, this passage in particular and what it says, but I thought it was just like a good introduction. It is, it's a good um, introduction to everything we'll be seeing throughout. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and there are other relations that I'm just like not mentioning, but uh, for example, there are a lot of allusions to Canada's military, um, mm -hmm. like it's loyalists, right? They're like everybody in town is a loyalist or something like that, or a descendant yeah. of the United Empire loyalists. Everybody cheered when the liberal got punched in the face. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. Which again, pointing to Lee Cox's own politics in this case. Um, you mentioned in talking about your um, your admiration for the book in this case you talked about the paragraph uh, the chapter the extraordinary mm -hmm. entanglement of mr pupkin in this case um mm -hmm. what's the relation in that paragraph or in that chapter with the boar war do you remember in this case so it's the the son mr pumpkin mr pupkin's son neil is one of the people he joins to with the horse riders, doesn't he? With the contingent to South Africa. Exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. What happens to and the, the The irony is that Mr. Pupkin, Judge Pepperly, has this very grand idea of his son in the war. It's this very noble thing. But the reality that Leacock paints is Neil as this like misbehaving drunk. Exactly. Um, do you have the passage in front of you on page 95 where he describes this? No, hold on. But I have the passage that you left, I think. No, I know. Let me see. Um, so if you, if you look oh yeah, okay. I have to go up. I think I read it already. Okay. Yeah, uh, you read. If you could have, yeah. yeah, at the lower part, right? The the one right under the five star, the four star. Yeah, page yeah, yeah. Brick. yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. But the strangest thing is that if the judge had known what everyone else in Mariposa knew, it would have broken his heart. If he could have seen Neil with his drunken flesh on his face in the billiard room of the Mariposa house, if he had known, as everyone else did, that Neil was crazed with drink the night he struck the liberal organizer when the old MacDonald government went out, if he could have known that even on that last day, Neil was drunk when he rode with the Mississauga force to the station to join the third contingent for the war, then all the street of the little town was one great roar of people. Yeah, and he, like, um, yeah. Yeah, that he goes on, right? But the judge never knew. And now yeah, but that's more like the idea of like yes. what happened. But this isn't, yeah. It's the idea is again the very dramatic irony that everyone in the town knows this, everyone but the judge, everyone but his dad. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and Leacock's really smart and, because knowing this then throws the scenes right before this into a new light. So it's Absolutely. just, I'm sorry, it's just more add on to why this book is so fucking great. No, but yeah, no, it's a, it's a really good point in this case. And again, I think kind of showing how this relates to the wider idea that uh, Leacock is going for, right? The setup and payoff right, that we were talking mm -hmm. about. So both on like on a structural level or a form level, it works in this case where similar to how Service's poem 
functioned, right? He starts off with what the idea of this town is. And then it's ultimately a small paragraph in the larger context of the book, but he just kind of throws a wrench in it in a sense mm. and tells you, well, no, it's not quite what you think. I'm telling you in a funny way because haha, <laughs> drunk people are always funny and that's true. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, it's supposed to make you think like all good satire, right? Like, mm-hmm what what am i actually talking about here not talking about just a drunk guy i'm talking about a guy who went to war and died for something that he didn't believe in. Mm-hmm. right he didn't care he was just drunk and went out to die and that's uh shown in the paragraph right after right for if you could find it in the meanness of your soul to tell him it would serve no purpose except to break his heart And there would rise up to rebuke you the pictured vision of an untended grave somewhere in the great silences of South Africa. I really like that in this case. Mm -hmm. Like there's the image and we'll come back to like the pictures in this case Um, because the judge, I don't know if you remember, the judge has like some very well-placed picture. Um, But also just the, the, the passage, the pictured vision of an untended grave somewhere yeah. in the great silences of south africa yeah and again it's like this is one of the few times i'm really going to recommend everybody read this book just because of its quality because even like as you build on this imagery of the Boer war in south africa and then you get into the next paragraph and it takes the time to talk about the wife because she obviously knows what's going on she knows what happened but she doesn't tell her husband and it gives this very like sad thing to again really highlighting how he's not also like he's not disparaging the small town because he says you don't know this town you don't know mary posa get the fuck out of here with your judgment no, no absolutely and i never thought of it but yeah it's it's interesting like the wife knows but he's maintaining this this very like high military image of his son mm-hmm. so there's probably i doubt this would have crossed lee cox's mind to be perfectly honest considering the era oh, for 100 percent but you know, with present day glasses, and because that is the whole point of literary analysis, there's something probably to say about the way that masculinity is constructed in this case, right? Um, through military endeavors. Um, mm-hmm. But again, I, it depends how you feel about authorial intent in this case. I personally don't care much about it. Um, yeah. It has some value, but it's not everything. So, mm-hmm. yeah, to, I'm with you. It's, it is interesting to consider uh to consider like the construction of in that respect um which i didn't write in the notes but i'm just i don't know yeah um no no it works just, for me just there yeah no i um, know i think it's you know authorial ten is always gonna be something we talk about and obviously like <laughs> i'm probably pulling some stuff out of my ass but i just think it's really interesting how the paragraph right afterwards really just jumps again it turns again pivots to the wife absolutely yeah and there's this thing, right, where, you know, the, this untended grave, there's an anonymity and a neglect and a desolation, mm-hmm. right, uh, that comes with this, um, which, again, relates back to what we were saying of Leacock's own opinions, right, of the concentration camps that were there in the Boer War, um, but also to just the public imagination of it, it was a flash moment, and people were very interested for a while, and there were cultural products, but ultimately... No one's like cultivating this yeah, image exactly. necessarily very quickly went away mm-hmm. for, you know, historical and just other reasons. Like people just kind of, it was so far away and no one really cared. So it just kind of went away. Um, so there's two kind of interpretations. And then I want to go to another part of the book and then we'll call it a day in this case. But there's two kind of interpretations. There is a bit more of a positive interpretation of Neil, right? Um so obviously he died in service to his country. They're positive in the wider sense in this case, not necessarily that it's good to die for mm-hmm. your country. Uh, but that framing, at least for his father, is a bit more positive. Um, but I'm trying to find that passage. Do you remember? Oh, yes. It's at the bottom of 96, or around the middle of 96. In any case, if you tried to tell Judge Pepperly about Neil now, he wouldn't believe it. He'd laugh it to scorn. That is Neil's picture in uniform, hanging in the dining room beside the Fathers of Confederation. That military looking man in the picture beside him is General Kitchen, whom you may perhaps have heard of, uh, for he was very highly spoken of in Neil's letters. General Kitchener was. In, um, 
All around the room, in fact, and still more in the judge's library upstairs, you will see picture of South Africa and the departure of the Canadian. There are none of the return, and of the mounted infantry, and of the unmounted cavalry, and a lot of things that only soldiers and the fathers of soldiers know about. The particular passage that I want to talk about here is that Neil is placed alongside the fathers of confederation in this case. What <laughs> does that tell us, Mac? <laughs> What, what does that indicate? That Neil was as legendary as John A. McDee's Nuts McDonald. Right. Like he's in, in, again, like if you want to take a positive spin on it, right. The Boer War was like this nation making thing. Right. Yeah. Again, like, well, I think, sorry, you look like you were... no, it's more just, I think the positive interpretation to me is that even when he's disparaging the war, Leacock will not disparage the people who chose to fight in it. Exactly. Yeah. Like even or as much as of that these things. Yeah. Yeah. Like even as much as you can disparage any major war, battle, whatever, you don't necessarily need to disparage the people that are fighting in it, except for if they're doing horrible, awful things in it. But like the common soldier or whatever, you know, is just almost doing their job. <laughs> Absolutely. And you know, to, to, to bring it back to this whole idea of nation building, you know, Leacock, again, as we mentioned, he's um, he's um, a, a Canadian nationalist, right? We, we I said imperialist in this case because he still has this image of empire in mind, but like today we'd call him a national. Mm -hmm. um, and so this idea of attaching yourself to these moments in which um, Canada becomes itself which seems to happen like every hundred years or so, or every 20 years or so, like there's like these flat and moments, World War One, World War Two, the Boer War, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, the 1960s. Mm -hmm. Like Canada is constantly searching for itself. And, you know, I think for Leacock, that's a good thing, despite the war that he's personally against. But the idea of an event that coalesces people together is something positive for him. Yeah, I don't know. Um, anything more to say about this particular passage or Judge Pepperly and Neil? Because there's another section that I want to address, but if you have anything to say, like, cool, go by all means. I think that's just about it. Yeah, I think I can't think of anything else at the moment. All right. It feels good to me. Did you, um, when you first approached this text uh, in the course that you did at Concordia, did you read the section on the candidacy of Mr. Smith, the election? in this case yes vaguely it's been a while but yes yeah did you reread it for um for this it's mm -hmm. about 40 pages after no i did not but tell me about it remind me of it all right so the the candidacy of mr smith is basically a scene you know, or a sketch in which we see the elector an electoral campaign in mariposa and leacock in his classic style lampoons the candidate, Mr. Smith, and the electorate at the same time, right? No one is spared. Uh, they sp He spared no expense on laughing at everyone. Um, and there's a passage here. So I'm looking specifically at page 137. Yeah. So um, here we go. Where is it? There was a section basically. Yeah, okay. There was a section basically that, um, you know, during the during you know Mr. Smith's uh, campaign, right, which is for the conservative leadership in this case, um, the scene is specifically for the conservative convention, right. He's foregrounding very much um, his allegiances to Britain in this case, like that's his platform, basically. Um, and again, kind of accurate to the time uh, that Leacock is talking about in. As we'll talk about next week, uh, next episode with Laurier, like he'd kind of distinguish himself by towing that line. The conservatives were hard line, British admirers, whereas under Laurier, the liberals kind of were like, you know, Canada's its own thing, maybe, right? Yeah. Like, um, Canada lives an ocean away, and it's just about 20 times the size of Britain. So, exactly. Right. So, you know, why don't, why don't you, you know, chill a bit um okay and there's a really good passage at the very start of this where mr smith says billy he said to this uh, desk clerk get a couple more and put them up on the roof of the calf behind the hotel wire down to the city and get a quotation on a hundred of them 
take them signs, American drinks out of the bar, put up new ones with British beer at all hours, clear out all the rye whiskey and order in Scotch and Irish, and then go up to the printing office and get me them placards case. So this kind of passage, at least, I think shows me two things. One, mm-hmm. uh, the British admiration, but also just Leacock's complete disdain for electoral politics, where he's like, it's it's all symbols. Who gives a shit? I think yeah. Yeah. it's the same thing. It's just, you just put a different sign up, right? It's, <laughs> it's not American beer, it's British beer, so vote for me. <laughs> um, Man, imagine if that was still the same way it was today, all elections just being symbolic. I, like, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I believe in my election every year. Mm. Like, my vote matters. My vote matters. And it does. Your vote does matter. matter and everybody should go out and vote. It's just... I think it would matter more under different structures. Like the way it's, the way it's set up, it, it's always going to be either between liberal or conservatives, right? Mm. But yeah, it's, I think it can be good. I think we just need to find a better representative system in this case but hey that's just um that's a discussion for another day we're not political scientists although i do have a um an interview with a political economist coming up so hey it's already recorded and it'll be on the show soon um so there's another passage in this case that kind of i think complements this idea of beer in this case um this is on 139, 140, where someone asks Mr. Smith a question. What do you think about imperial defense? Asked another question, which, said Mr. Smith, imperial defense. Of what? Of everything. Who says it? Said Mr. Smith. Everybody is talking of it. What do the conservative boys at Ottawa say about it? Answered Mr. Smith. They're all for it. Well, I'm for it too. <laughs> so, <laughs> again, just like the very like under underhanded joke in this case that yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Smith has no idea what his own platform is. <laughs> it's just like, what do the conservatives think? This? All right, fine. The whole point is that you get free beer. <laughs> Don't think about it. <laughs> um, but also I'm bringing up the idea of imperial defense because for Smith, it's automatic, mm. right? And I think it's an important way of imagining um <laughs> of imagining the way that the average Canadian would have thought about it for a bit is like, well, yeah, it's, of course, we we have to take care of imperial defense because we've always done, right? Mm. You know, when have we not taken care of imperial defense or been concerned with it? And this is starting to change because as people like Leacock are pointing out, it's fucking stupid. It's a, it's a non-issue, right? That nobody really thinks about anymore. It's automatic, so it, you shouldn't necessarily just blindly follow it <laughs> and i just want it like i don't know if you have anything to add about this particular sketch or this uh sequence that i pointed out i just thought it was interesting to add on to it as a kind of final um you know jab that leacock was pointing at. right yeah i don't know if you had any no it's not about it so in what i think was kind of interesting in this case and i'm curious what your thoughts are about it a lot of the information that I found for this particular episode was on two actual uh, on two actual uh, uh, doctoral theses uh, that talk about the Boer War, in this case, in literature, mm-hmm. which were published in 2021 and 2020, if I'm mistaken. So it's, it's, it kind of baffled me that people were still interested in the Boer War, like 125 years later in this case. And I'm wondering in this case, do you feel like there's any kind of legacy to the Boer War, as far as you know, um, that you can point to in this case? One of the one of the dissertations talks about, yeah, the Bridget Brown one, which again will be in the show notes, like talks about contemporary books in this case that address the Boer War. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Do you feel like there is any kind of legacy? Because I do find it interesting that there is that kind of academic or their resurgence in its interest, but I don't know. Personally, I feel like its legacy is mostly as a foreshadow of the 20th century conflicts, but I don't know if you have anything to add about about the Boer War and its legacy. Yeah, if it has any, because I find it weird that suddenly like people would have not really like Canada and war has always been its only legacy is that it doesn't have one really, like, and that's just Canada's relation with war in general, is that 
we were very much we very much bury our relationships with war except for like very right. particular battles yeah yeah yeah. i'd have to look it up was there any kind of celebration quote-unquote celebration or memorial in 1999 or something like that for the boer war for the 100th anniversary um i don't think so i don't well i would have been three at the time so i don't know but uh um hmm. let's see 1999 uh canada yeah there actually was according to the cbc in this case so this was a mm -hmm. 1999 article canada marked the 100th anniversary of its first war as a country sunday canadians joined britain in fighting dutch settlers in south africa many credit the boer war with preparing canada's military for the second for the two world wars that followed yeah so there mm -hmm. was a ceremony and everything okay oh, there good, you go. For, good for canada in 1999 but it's interesting that it never quite made it to the level of 1812, like politically speaking, because it, I personally, I feel it's just as, as like, it's on that same level of significance as in not really um, for as far as Canada is concerned. But you know, obviously the war of 1812 got like a push by the Harper government for its 200th anniversary, as we've talked about before. But it's interesting to me that the Boer War never seemed to get that treatment necessarily. And I'm just like wondering out loud why that might have been the case, like what the selection process would have been for that particular. For why why not celebrate the Boer War? Or yeah, because we celebrate 1812, or we decided to like go for 1812, but it's just like arguably uh -huh. maybe the, the concentration more, camps, I guess. But we do, yeah, yeah, I guess we just want to. Although Canada didn't do, it, although we did it as part uh -huh. of the British, so you know, not really much better. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, and. Yeah, I guess that's that's it. I just had like these brief questions of like I don't know what to make of this. It's like this weird what to make of the board, but not this. Yeah, it's just like it it exists. <laughs> I don't know how to end this episode aside from saying like it was a big <laughs> deal at the time, but now it's just like whatever. Hopefully, like maybe someone with a military history background can tell us because I'm just like yeah, I don't I don't I don't know. I just don't personally. I don't know if there's anything to make of it. You know fine it just exists we got to talk about stephen leacock so that's fun um all right so next episode talking about a prime minister Ew. So, yay um but yeah if you have i have like a whole list of episodes to do if listeners are still listening as we just like petered out on that one on the boar war send us episode suggestions if you want but mm -hmm. we're never gonna end this show so it's gonna keep going forever and ever and ever um and yeah uh mac where can people contact us we have links on spotify itunes you can send us an email get in contact through the facebook page we don't have a twitter account anymore thank god you can send us your notes comments concerns message us leave a haiku oh, please that's 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 gonna yes please do that leave a haiku of the show leave a haiku yeah um trying to think if there's anything else leave a review mm -hmm. that's it share the show have fun share the show. Get on Patreon. yep Listen listenership keeps going up and that's fun so thanks all right and thank you for listening to this petered out episode the boar war ladies and gentlemen Woo! the boar war petered out all right catch you on the flip side